Good evening and welcome to our fifth episode of our virtual journey. This month we have Susan Hansen, who is a multiple top award winner with Florida Watercolor Society, as well as a signature member of the National and the American Watercolor Societies. Today she's going to teach us about composition and design. She'll take us through several of her paintings, explaining how she conceives, creates, and completes a painting. You'll be amazed. And don't forget, we have question and answer at the end. Put your questions in the Q&A and we'll answer them at the end. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Sue Hansen and welcome to this presentation. Uh, before I get started into the nitty gritty of it, I thought I would share my background with folks who just don't know anything about me. Um, it starts with Syracuse University where I graduated as a printmaking major and ended up in New York as an art director in advertising. And I was in advertising for 28 years at various agencies. One thing you learn in advertising is to solve problems. You become a problem solver. And you learn too your goal is to produce something that is engaging, entertaining, and memorable. And you have to do it all in 30 seconds. It was a really wonderful time of my life. And I see now how much that career in advertising has affected my painting career. So now I'm just painting full time. I'm taking lessons, I'm going to school, and my husband and I decide to move from Dallas to Fort Lauderdale. And shortly after that, I began teaching at the Boca Raton Museum School. I taught watercolor and figure drawing, my very favorite, for about 12 years. And during that time, I was taking class with Diane Nance, who is my mentor. And if there is one lesson I learned early on from Diane is you have to paint more than just a pretty picture. So with her guidance and her encouragement, I applied and was accepted at the National Watercolor Organizations. And this past convention with Florida Watercolor, I was on a panel discussion about those very organizations. And at the same time, I met Cheryl Fletcher Kuhn. And we were chatting just back and forth about workshops. And she said, you know, Sue, I would take a workshop from you if you did something about how you think. Well, I was really flattered, but clueless how I would ever do something like that. Sometime later, I had this idea. What if I was able to take an artist through my painting, step by step, and sort of discuss my thinking, my conversation that I'm having with myself while I'm painting? And it so happens, I was photographing my paintings as I was painting them. So there was a progression and I had it recorded. It seemed like a reasonable idea. So today we're going to take that journey through several paintings. I'm going to talk about what, you know, inspired an idea, the artist that's important to me who inspired me. Uh, some of the tricks I use to get ideas started. And of course, I'm going to talk about those design tools. So I hope there's a little idea here that you could apply to your own painting. And if nothing else, I hope you find this entertaining. We're going to start with a painting that I call the unfamiliar walk. This painting really began in January of 2018. We had just adopted Lola, a one-year-old rescue dog. 
actually a hound dog. And here she is out for a walk, but always turning with this look of apprehension. At the same time, in Diane Nance's class, we were assigned to visualize in a painting the phrase eerie travel. So while I was thinking about the assignment, I came across this photo. I loved the palette. I loved the overall sense of the environment. It was creepy to me, and certainly I couldn't identify where I was. And there was a sense of it being quite eerie. The dark sky also was a plus and added to the mystery. For me, my problem was solved. I had wanted to paint my dog, so why not put her here in this eerie place? For some reason, I was very organized about this assignment. I started with a three value sketch in gouache, really small. Now, this helps me enormously to simplify. It simplifies the shapes, it makes compound shapes, and it helps you to see the painting as an abstract. Because when you simplify the values, when you lose the silhouette of the objects, you're left with shapes. I took the three value sketch into a preliminary small painting, gouache again, and small. Now, notice these three, or actually there's more than three, these triangular shapes on the floor of this painting. I had always in my mind that these were going to be shark fins in the sand. Now, I have a thing for sharks, so at this point I knew I was going to use it, but I had no idea how I was going to paint them. So the painting begins. This is a 48 by 36 inch canvas. You know, I start them with just lots of paint, transparent paint, almost like a watercolor wash act, I think. Um, you'll notice I started painting the dog red. Now I like having some kind of color to paint on top of. And I knew this was going to be very dark, but I was going to let the red come through. Obviously a close-up of that face on Lola, that look of apprehension, and I love now how her head was a compound shape with the sky behind. I just really liked that look. Now I'm at the point where I have to figure out this floor. I know it's going to be shark fins, but how do I paint it? So just for the fun of it, I googled land sharks. I was sure I was going to get an SNL skit coming out of that, but I didn't. Lo and behold, there is a thing called a land shark that happens to come in this palette, and with this fabulous black and white pattern on the bodies of the sharks and on their fins. This piece was coming together so easily. It was so much fun. And you can see I'm just developing those fins, you know, altering the size. I'm beginning also to darken the bottom of the painting. I like doing this. I like having somebody sort of be able to come into this painting and go up. It basically is finished except, you know, just touching up here and there. Now somewhere between these two frames is the actual color of the painting. Um, it's finished. But I wanted to talk about one thing here that I'm starting to do. It's the contrast of using something very flat and graphic against something very painterly and modeled. And you'll notice that the leash is just a flat red. The rest of the painting is modeled. 
but that leash is much more graphic in its appearance. This does two things for me. It, first of all, the red just relieves your eye from all this turquoise and black and dark. And it also leads directly to the viewer as if they were walking the dog in the unfamiliar walk. Now we're going to move from the unfamiliar walk, which I found, you know, relatively easy to do, to a painting I found much more difficult. I had been working on a, a body of work using my character Prudence, who I use her quite frequently. She is uh, a little girl. She wears a costume, a Napoleonic military hat, a tutu, and has a magic wand. So here we go. Okay, here's Prudence in the Joyride. Originally, now, this was a small watercolor and not quite as sinister as this large acrylic painting. But it sold and the gallery wanted another piece, a piece similar in mood and feel. So I thought about this and I had wanted to do a rabbit and I knew there was a fabled animal called a jackalope. And I thought maybe I could use it. Oh, by the way, they don't exist. So I played around with rabbits in different poses and this one in particular the drawing came out so static and for me it was too similar to the previous painting. Thank goodness for the internet because I found this hair running which actually gave me an excuse to use a horizontal format which I don't use very often. But this format led to all sorts of compositional problems. I didn't have room for the exaggerated antlers. The direction of the hair was pretty severe, so no matter how I used it, facing right, facing left, my question was, how do I position prudence? So the only solution was to have my character sitting backwards. Now, Already, I'm starting to have problems with proportions. Proportions and the figure. She's not a toddler. She's a little girl. She's, you know, seven or eight. Then there is the issue of the sphere in the sky. Is it the sun? Is it a moon? Is it just a sphere? I started thinking it's, it's the moon because I like the moonlight. Now maybe there's a shadow, a horizon line. No, my goal was to keep it simple. Yes, it was going to be an eclipse in the sky, a lunar eclipse. And, you know, looking that up, it's a symbol of internal change. And that sounded positive and optimistic to me. Finally, it's coming together. I had to add her little magic wand and her tutu. I did change the color on the sky. It was a little too gray for me. And of course I added stars in the night sky. It was finished now, except for the title. And titles are really important to me. I struggle with them most of the time. And I search around for titles. I look at poetry, I look at lyrics, this one came straight from Webster only because I was so desperate and I was looking up hair and two words down I found harebrained, an adjective, flighty, foolish. That seemed like the perfect title. Often when I just had it with acrylics and never want to see acrylics again, I go back to the medium I really love, which is watercolor. And in this case, I decided I'm going to mix it up a little bit, but the majority of these paintings are watercolors with a dash of acrylic. 
A friend, an artist friend, had sent me two photos of her dying tulips. And I can remember being on the phone and we were chatting about the shapes. We were both just in love with the shapes of these tulips. I actually loved them so much that I was able to produce five paintings from just these two photos. Another influence in this series, and an important influence, came from a contemporary artist I was introduced to by the name of Charlene von Heel. It was this painting that got me to look at that particular contrast I spoke of earlier, combining a painterly approach with a graphic element. To me, it's a very courageous move and something certainly out of my comfort zone. Although I always liked it and it's appealed to me. So it was time to try. So we'll look at one painting in this series called Carbon Compound. This painting is done on Fabriano cold press watercolor paper that's glued to a very thin piece of aluminum. It's from a company called Raymar in Arizona, they produce this product. The benefit is that you can hang it on the wall without a frame, without glass. Of course, it needs a protective varnish, and I also use cold wax. I rub in the cold wax. So I knew this series was going to be sort of a semi-abstract design. And obviously it was going to be organic in feel, and I wanted to use a limited palette. So I chose to work with neutral tint, sepia, lunar black, and a small amount of quinacridone burnt orange. The reason for this palette was that I know these colors are really playful. You can have a good time, especially when you use hot press which is my normal paper. Um, I could play with these colors. They do fun things when you let it just happen. I could make blooms. I can graduate it with water. I can lift the paint. I can use dry brush. Notice that I'm turning this painting all the time because I want to see how it's going to work in different formats as a vertical, as a horizontal. Now I'm basically done with this painting. It's pretty much a value study, but I want to look, I want a flat background, a flat neutral background. So I pull out my acrylics and my next task will be to add flat black. And adding this flat black, I do it very slowly and tentatively. And finally, stealing direct from Charlene Van Hale, I put in these stripes in the background using interference. And these are sort of magical. They appear and they disappear as the light hits them. This is another painting in the series and another. It, it was just a really fun series from just two photos of dead tulips. Obviously, there are paintings everywhere. So with five paintings, in watercolor, under my belt, it's time to go back to acrylics. About a year ago, I did this painting called The Skies. It may look familiar to some of you because it originally was a watercolor, and I liked the watercolor enough to say, I'm gonna do this up big. So this now is an acrylic. I also was interested in doing another piece that had the same feel, had the same look, and so that's the painting we're going to look at. This next painting starts with a small collage. It's just two photos I put together, and I often use this technique to get an idea going. 
I put down things that don't necessarily belong together. I just pick things that I would think would be fun to paint and I put them down. It's a great way to start an idea. I loved the photo of this little person. She was interesting to me in an old soul sort of way. And I found the androgynous quality of her interesting. I wanted to play with that while all the time having this sensual female portrait in the background. You'll notice too, there's also this game of scale. The collage has just sort of forced me to use that and it's a design element that I personally like and rarely use. So I began this canvas, 48 by 36. I blocked the drawing in and started my underpainting. Right about here, I realized I'm definitely going to keep that black and white background on the portrait. But my little person, I want to have in this vivid, bright, patterned costume. The question is, what vivid, bright color? I made a change to red because I just felt that yellow-orange wasn't going to work. And I also, at this point, I'm interested in the gesture of her hands, but the photograph, it was so hard to read what was going on that sometimes you have to be your own model. The posture of this little person is to me so uncomfortable. The costume looks oversized. I thought it might be fun to just put a itchy wool plaid pattern to add to that uncomfortableness. Nothing in her posture looks casual or comfy. By the way, I pull reference from everywhere. Google is my friend. This never comes out of my head direct. It's reference that I use. Doing all this pattern work is sometimes mindless, but I must admit, I have fun doing it. I borrow patterns from everywhere. Fashion magazines. This one happens to be one of my favorites. Unfortunately, I did cut into it, but I had enough here to work with. So I'm putting that pattern on her skirt. Now I have to deal with the chair, and I just thought I'm going to reuse that pattern I had in the previous painting because I really liked it. I'm finished now with the faces, which is really my favorite part to paint. And I was satisfied that the little person's expression said, I don't belong here, I don't want to be here, and I don't aspire to the glamorous beauty behind me. But I did think something was missing, some sort of little graphic button. So I put a 35 millimeter border on the left and top of the piece. I felt it did two things. It certainly said photo, and I think the strong black and white pattern balanced the right side black and white pattern. As for the title, I needed a name that had no particular gender. I wanted again to reinforce the ambiguity of the sitter. This is Sitting with Keith. Sometimes I start a painting and I just figure, oh, I'll work it out as I paint. And this painting will talk to me, it'll tell me what it needs, and it'll all come together. In this case, uh, neither happened. This is a painting with a long, long history. I started it at least three years ago. It's gold gesso on paper painted with gouache and watercolor. Obviously, I wasn't happy with it. But remember, one of the beauties of working on gesso is you can easily lift. 
I did try and save all the little bits and pieces I liked, the flutter of something in the right corner, the dots of color flowing here and there, those winged arches behind her. So back to the drawing board. At the time, I was absolutely enamored with a butterfly theme. So enamored that I was sure I knew where I was going with this painting. So now I've created this hand gesture that requires the woman to be holding something. The question is, what is she holding? Perhaps some sort of chrysalis? At the same time, I started working on her costume, the background, and trying different treatments of her face. And as you can see, there's plenty of lifting and experimenting going on. She has a mask on and black gloves. Of course, all the little bits and pieces from the original image are long gone. A new flat background, but now the shape behind her is not to my liking. Her face is black. I've cut into the big shape behind her. But frankly, this painting isn't talking to me. I really don't know where to go with it. So in 2018, this painting goes into the drawer and it's parked. Fast forward to 2021. I actually had forgotten all about this piece until I was cleaning out my art drawers and I rediscovered it. And rediscover I did with fresh eyes and a new attitude. After not seeing or working on this painting, it's funny how easily you can eliminate shapes and things that were once so precious. Time allows you to be brutal, in a good way. Now the painting was talking to me. The hands had to go, along with the sphere. The position of the head had to change so that the woman might be a little bit more engaging. Her headdress was easy once I came up with a motif that I could use throughout the painting. The three angular half circles in her headdress you can see again repeated in her costume. I'm still having issues with that big shape behind her. But in the meantime, I work on her costume, lifting, putting stripes in, stripes out. I know I needed some light values inside her costume, so I played around. And you can see on her collar, I used that Carla O'Connor trick of taking numerals and making a design out of them. Finally, I resolve a number of issues. The big shape, I cut an angle into it, that motif again. I put a wash on her face to take it back and down. And I paint in some sort of shape off to the left because I felt the left side needed some balance. I scrap the numerals on her sleeve for something smaller, a little more delicate, a little bit of color thrown in there. And Truthfully, because of the deadline to enter this painting into a show was so tight, I called it quits. And I titled this painting, The Red Painting. And finally, you know, we have all had an incredible year. It's just been quite a time. And frankly, I found it difficult to paint, especially around the fall. I just was slowing down to a, a snail's pace in terms of producing any sort of work. And I just felt a strong urge to just paint something personal, to express this year uh, in a painting. And that's what we're going to look at. The final painting we're going to look at today was started in late summer from a photo that I think sort of says it all. I was just feeling out of sorts, really down, and I thought maybe there's something here that I can use in a painting that I could convey how I'm really feeling about this time. 
And I started a 48 by 36 inch canvas. I put myself off center, <laughs> which seems appropriate since I was feeling that way. Um, the background was going to be important, or I should say the environment. It was going to be relevant to the story. I wanted an empty space. I wanted a space that was void of color. I wanted maybe some light coming from the from the windows behind. But what was outside, I didn't think was important. It was what was around me, what was immediate in the space. All the time I was painting, I was thinking, can I play with my continuing character prudence? Would she fit in this painting? And so with gouache, I just tested whether I liked the idea of doing this by putting that hat on and putting the wand on the floor. I also saw that there's something wrong with the palette here. I want this background to be cool so the shirt cannot be cool. I need something warm. So there's going to be a change there. So this red shirt obviously is a whole lot better. There is a lot of red in her jeans as well. So uh, there is a color contrast going on, this warm and cool idea. I've obviously wiped off the gouache on her head for the hat. And I'm just kind of looking now, is this ready to get prudence? I get the hat in, I'm happy with that. I have the wand in, but the foot now is bothering me. There's just way too much contrast down at the bottom of the painting. So I'm going to have to fix that. I'm going to put a wash on the shirt that warms it up even more. Okay, so I have Prudence in here now with her white face makeup, her red drawn in lips. I have a sock now, a striped sock, and so I just thought it might be fun to repeat that pattern, that stripe in the back. There's blinds. I've worked on the floor of this in the space and I put some reflection in there, but I knew something is missing. This, this little button that I need here isn't here yet, even though I'm happy with the figure. I'm especially happy with that face with the barely can see eyes. So that slit there in the back, that vertical black line is actually a door. That's how I envisioned it. And I was thinking, hmm, can I put a cat walking out of the space? Or can I put a hand coming into the space? I had to think about this one for a while until I was shown this painting. This is another painting, but I went, whoa, that is exactly what I need in that opening of the door. I put in a little Prudence character looking in. I was just really pleased. That's what this painting needed. Some kind of thing that you could discover after you got close enough to the painting. I realized that that little face is fairly subtle, but I do know once you see it, it's kind of all you see. There was one other thing that was bothering me, and it was that right hand, that flesh tone there. I just wasn't happy with that. And so I just covered it with a magical white glove. The title is interesting. It came from a friend of mine who's just a beautiful writer, and she had this phrase in a, in a text that she was writing me. And I thought, I'm going to lift this and use it as a title. And it is feeling what I cannot see. 
So we've come to the end of the journey. You went through several paintings with me. You saw them from beginning to end and everything in between. You saw what inspires me, what gives me an idea, different approaches, and the design tools that I work with. There was the idea of a phrase. It could be a cliche. Those are great because the idea is right there. Um, you saw a collage. Uh, starting that way is so freeing for me because I just put in things that I want to paint and you know I make them work into an idea. Um, finding shapes, there's shapes everywhere. I happen to find um, shapes in an organic object which was the dead tulip. And finally, you saw something much more personal uh, that a painting I just wanted to do and express how I was feeling. You know, every painting isn't a huge success, but either way, they all take a lot of work, they take time, and they take thinking. Uh, always, I'm working with the end game that my paintings are engaging, that I can pull a viewer in, they can find something, they can discover, they can be entertained by the color, by the subject, by the brushwork, and hopefully they remember it, that it's an image, a painting that they remember. That to me is a really successful painting. So thank you for joining me today. And with that, I'll take any questions. Great, thank you so much. That was just so amazing to see how your process goes in a number of different paintings and what you're thinking and how it changes from your original concept. That, that is There's a conversation going all the time. That is, that's, I have a little conversation, but nothing like you, you have there. So that's, that is great. So there is a question. How long before you start a painting, do you get the concept of what you're going to paint? Like, uh, it, it depends. It's usually sort of in my head for a while. I'm thinking about it. Like right now, I know I'm going to do something with a long horn steer which is really something different for me. Yeah. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet. So, but I'm thinking about it. So that counts. And then at some point, I'm going to do some sketches. And an idea will work itself up. But, you know, it, it takes me a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. And do you ever go down that um, road and get to the end and say, mm, no, this is going in the garbage? I mean, has, have oh, yeah. you ever... Oh, okay. <laughs> I like yeah. a lot. Well, it's yeah, good to know. <laughs> really, I filter. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So super. And um, actually, let's look in the. Okay, so actually, we don't have any more questions. So okay. Um, I thank you so much. Um, it was very amazing and helpful to me, and I hope for the viewers as well. Well, I hope so too. Okay. Yeah. And we'll see you in a couple of months. Absolutely. Right, right. Okay. Also, also, so I'd like to do a little commercial for next month. And next month we have Sandy Maudlin. She is our 2021 online juror. And she will be giving the exhibition review next month, July 15th. So it's a very great way to learn about other people's paintings and what she thinks about them and what you can learn from that. Always fun. See you then.